what was first seen by John Green was a pyramid. There was something here. But it leaves the open-ended question of who did it and what it was for. Tonight I take notes on the place of my earlier acquaintance today, which was of some mystery. I am astounded that what I had seen before me had indeed survived the passage of time in the manner it had presented itself. I am certain that I was given witness today to some remnants of an ancient culture, of this I am sure. I cannot, and it is beyond my immediate comprehension, understand why a fear of such a place is displayed by the natives. The pyramid itself is located at near the outskirts of the city of Gympie. First viewing, people do tend to be a little bit disappointed, but it's not until they walk over the site and then they gradually gain the impressions of what it would have looked like just by even looking at the stone circle, the stone walls that still exist. From the facts that we know, it was more of a stepped pyramid platform made of hand-carved or hand-shaped sandstone bricks. It was about 100 feet high and it was around the 200 feet long in, in all directions. At the top was a structure similar to that of Stonehenge, which we believe was an astrological observatory. John Green's journeys, which sort of basically began in 1851, he conducted 14 journeys with the Aborigines. He was on one particular expedition and um, they were following the Mary River and they came across uh, over a hill. He looked back with his eyeglass, or his spyglass as he called it, and, and from that, he was able to take further descriptions and, um, and drawings uh, of what he had actually seen. And these were the things that uh, formed the basis of, um, of the Gympie Pyramid story because they're the only records that were ever recorded of what was there at that particular time. I took further wander on the site of the ruins. I turned, and from the high point on a nearby hillock I took my spyglass and viewed the summit whose presence I had failed to examine at close quarters. There was, it appears to be situated at that very moment, a large stone disc-shaped table mounted on what I believe to be two supporting pillars. I desired closer inspection of the hill mound for there may be many mysteries to unravel, but the increasing annoyance by the natives of my stolen to take view is... Community itself is very divided. It is known that uh, in the late 1800s that the, the locals used to go out to the site, collect stones, take them back into the city area uh, to build the foundations of houses, uh, commercial buildings, uh, even the churches. And eventually over time the pyramid structure was, was totally uh, destroyed for the next 50 odd years, the story basically died. It wasn't until the 70s that the stories of the old pyramid site and everything started to come to the forebear. And uh, with the announcement of this great discovery and so forth, uh, lots of items of things started to come out of the woodwork. That created 
created more fantasies and, and more stories. So the, the myth and the, or the legend and everything else grew and grew and grew. And of course, at the same time, the divisions between those who believed and those who didn't believe grew also. While my companions encircled the rim, continuing their display of fear and entering the place, I came upon a hill mound with walled escarpments of man-made interference. It wound around the near bare hillock, seemingly towards its peak, like a great serpent entwined upon its prey. My thoughts were placed into a quandary as to its purpose, for at the entrance to the terrace pathway there were two stone block edifices, which bore on each of their surfaces outwards the symbols of two serpents entwined as if in battle. I have never seen such complexity. Yeah, well, John Green himself, um, he was my great-grandfather, and James, of course, was my grandfather, and then, of course, James II, he was my father. Between all of these connections came the, uh, the references to the the, uh, the Gimpy Pyramid story. I had no knowledge of the Gimpy Pyramid or the connections with uh, my forebears uh, until I returned here to, to Gimpy in uh, 1981. And at that stage, uh, my father was not too well. And it was there that he actually revealed to me um, the old wooden chest that he had hidden under his bed. Of course, we, we knew as kids that he had this wooden chest under his bed. And um, whenever it wasn't there, we'd try to sneak in to open it and see what was in it. When he realised that he was going to die, uh, he took me aside and he said, uh, this box is yours, look after it. He said, because it was one of the most valued possessions that his father and his, and his grandfather had ever owned. Uh, you've got to promise me one thing, he said, you're not to open it, he said, until after I go. In due course, when I opened it, I found an amazing hoard of history that was totally unknown to the family, to me, or whatever. And then in those records were the references to the, the pyramid site. Everything went well until last year, when it was suddenly announced by the government that they intended to build a huge bypass through the outskirts of Gympie City to alleviate the traffic problems. To our surprise and dismay, it was going to cut straight through the whole of the pyramid site. If something else doesn't turn up, or we're unable to verify anything further, this will be the end of the mystery because it will always remain unsolved. Despite the evidences of John Green and James Green and dozens of other people who are all academics in their fields, we've lost the battle and we can only use the evidences and the recordings and the histories as uh, an anecdote to Australia's history. The Gimpy Pyramid story will end with a question mark when that dozer first goes through. And we shall probably cry a tear. 